All right, this can make it seem a little humorous uh, at first. Uh, I want to talk about divisiveness, divisive people. Uh, I shared an article with a couple folks in the congregation, um, I guess it was last week, that this kind of inspired this lesson. I'm going to be uh, taking some excerpts from that. Uh, it may not seem immediately obvious, you, you know, if you remember the old cartoon Popeye, you know, Brutus, he was the rough and tough guy, and he was obviously, you know, causing problems in, in groups, and he could, a guy like that in our congregation could definitely cause problems, but also uh, the candy man, you know, the ice cream man, the guy you never see him expecting, you know, those people can be equally as dangerous, and that will be brought to light as we go through this presentation. I want to uh, remind you of the Tower of Babel. Everybody knows the Tower of Babel, the, the story. Do you remember why they could, had to stop work on the Tower of Babel? Well, it was because God confused their languages, right? Caused disunity among the group. They couldn't communicate with each other. They couldn't speak the same thing or do the same thing. And so as a, wor as a result, the work had to stop and they had to go to other places. It just, it just <coughs> came to an end. Well, I'm not talking about necessarily the Tower of Babel. Uh, today, I want to talk about the work st stopping, though. And, and when we're not unified, if Satan, if you want to twist this analogy around, if Satan somehow stops us from working on God's castle, uh, not necessarily confuse our languages, but we stop speaking the same things, we stop working together, stop communicating, um, then the same thing can occur, divisions can occur. I want to remind us of this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, which says, Paul's pleading to the church in Corinth, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And this is from the New King James Version. I like how the, this verse is translated. It talks about being perfectly joined, you know, being perfected in this, in this joint uh, partnership that we have, but it, it occurs by us all speaking the same things and not having any divisions among us. And that brings us to the passage that we're going to be basing the rest of this lesson on today, which is Romans chapter 16, verse 17 through 20. I've, if you have a Bible in front of you, I encourage you to turn to uh, the book of Romans and flip over to chapter 16. Um, and as, <coughs> as we go through this lesson, just look down at your Bible and refer back to this. I'm going to have the scriptures on the board, but I'd like for you to also read it in your own, have it in front of you as well, to, to refer to during this lesson, because I'm not always going to have the scripture on the board, and I may be making some points along the way that you might want to refer to. And the passage says this. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so our outline is going to be taking on uh, these three sections. And I want to remind us, because this warning is found in God's word, God doesn't waste words in the Bible. You know, he tells us stuff for a reason. It's likely that we'll face these problems at some point in time. And so that's why we need this, these instructions. There will be uh, people in the church that's from time to time that we're being asked to avoid. And you may think that this would contract on the, contrast on the surface or be opposed to what God commands us to do, which is love, right? You know, love your love Lord your God with all your heart and also love your neighbor as yourself. And so on the surface, you're thinking, well, if I'm to, he's asking me to avoid certain people, that seems like unloving. But it's not a contradiction. Sometimes our service to others, what God commands us to do, demands that we do avoid certain people. And so we're going to be studying this uh, passage in three main sections. Paul's appeal to them. Uh, we're going to look at divisive people with the instruction what we can learn uh, about divisive people from this passage. And also, finally, God's promise, uh, which brings hope for the future. So let's look at Paul's appeal first. In verse 17, he says, Now I urge you, I think King James Version says, I beseech you. Um, so it's a strong uh, urging there. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. So it's Paul's pleading for his readers to do two things, to watch out and to avoid. Now, to watch out is really to keep your eye on somebody. It's, it's literally to bend away from, if you look at the Greek word, or as it's commonly been defined, to fully avoid or to deliberately, uh, to take deliberate and decisive action. And there may be people in the church that we must identify and move away from. 
And the reason is that divisive people are, in fact, dangerous, uh, according to God. Now, some might ask, uh, well, isn't this being judgmental? Is this being unloving? Uh, no, uh, it can be. Uh, we're judgmental if we look down on someone as though we're morally superior to them. You know, like we're putting ourselves, saying we're, we don't have any problems and you have all the problems. But this appeal is for something different. It's something more like discernment, I feel. Uh, we must be able to identify dangerous people within the church without slipping into this state of being judgmental. Uh, God's command is for us uh, to love, but it does not mean that we should uh, accept or ignore uh, divisiveness in the name of uh, humility or, or anything else. We can't avoid it. Uh, avoidance, uh, as being commanded here, uh, his plea to avoid is not uh, any kind of coldness or cruelty, as it may seem. But it's also not pretending that the problem doesn't exist. In fact, if we, if we look the other way, then that would be equally as wrong, right? Because we're ignoring uh, the instruction. Avoidance is uh, deliberately keeping distance and, and purposefully refusing to, to move toward or, or be, get close to certain uh, people. Avoiding divisive people means not being their best friend, not trusting our hearts in their hands, not encouraging them in, into positions of leadership, not opening our home to them, etc. It's really distancing ourselves from them and moving away from association with them. But avoidance, I want to point out, it's, it's not hiding. It's not a cowardly thing. And sometimes we, we don't want to, we, that's what we want to do. We just want to hide from the problem. But avoidance is not hiding. Uh, for example, if you see somebody um, in the grocery store that we're supposed to be avoiding, are you going to duck behind the aisle? You know, are you gonna are you gonna act like you're looking for something on the bottom shelf and and, and you weren't there? That's not what this is. You know, um, uh, this kind of avoidance is is more valiant than that. God's not asking us to be cowardly. In fact, to do to do that to 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 hide is is uh, deception, and it and it's it's not forthcoming and it's not it's not what God wants. Uh, it is a clear thinking commitment to watch out for and steer clear of dangerous people uh, within the church. Again, this is a command that Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and that's why the letter is called Romans, and so he's encouraging everyone in the church uh, to do this. So here's some questions I want us to all ask ourselves. Are we watchful for divisive people? Um, like I said, God doesn't waste words. This is going to come up from time to time. We need to be aware of it as a congregation and individually. Are we following God's commands to avoid them? Or are we neglecting our responsibility to do that? <clears throat> now, are we using godly discernment in our judgment, or are we being cruel and judgmental in executing this? Now, this would be equally as wrong, and this would be equally as wrong. Are we cowardly or deceptive through our avoidance? See, all these things would be wrong. So we have to do execute this, but we have to do it in a godly way, the way that God wants us. And again, when we set, we set some goals for ourselves for this year, and it was to, to, to set ourselves to a godly standard, to hold each other accountable to a higher standard, and I think all of these things... Uh, we need to be uh, considering. So back to our outline, um, let's look at uh, divisive people. He talks a little bit about some characteristics of divisive people, and the question is, how can we tell which people that we should be avoiding from this passage? Well, let's look at 17 <coughs> and 18 again. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who, uh, who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So how can we tell which people to avoid? Well, God tells us in these verses. But before we get into that too much, I think it should be um, noted that this is not an, a, an appeal to just avoid people who may, we may find being difficult, okay? Uh, of course, God, uh, of course, these people you would like to deliberately, decisively avoid. You know, some people, they just get on our nerves or they irritate us, and we want to avoid those people. We find them difficult to deal with, and we want to avoid those people. That's not what he's talking about here. Some people we may be intimidated by, or we don't like how they behave uh, in a certain way. They just, they just get on our nerves. That's not what he's talking about here. This appeal is in reference to a specific kind of people in the church. These are people that are not just difficult. These are people that are labeled as being dangerous for, the, for, the, for what they actually cause uh, the church, uh, the, the damage that they cause. So also, before we, we get into this, uh, we need to remember 
Well, let me just follow up here. It's not merely difficult people. It's not just annoying people. It's not just intimidating people. It's dangerous people. Everybody has that. And I want to remind everybody that this is not a witch hunt. You know, this is not an opportunity for us to uh, sit around in the pew out there and think, okay, well, you know, that person's divisive. This person, th this message is towards you, too, each and every one of us. This is for us to get something out of. And so before uh, we move, for move forward, I want to know that this is really just about following what God has commanded us to do. And this is to hold us all to a higher standard, hold each other to a higher standard. It's about how to exercise godly discernment. So I want us to meditate on this passage, make it a part of the way that we think about the church, the way that we think about the people in the church, things that we can do to be wise in our dealings and to watch out for what I'm about to talk about here. And I'm going to break this thing down into three sections. <coughs> Divisiveness, doctrinal obstacles, and manipulative speech. All three things that are listed in this passage. So let's look at divisiveness real quick. So I looked this up in a couple dictionaries on, online. This is where it's talking about people causing divisions among you. It really means, to this the word divisions here, it means causing disagreement between people, causing them to separate into different groups. Uh, cr means also, another definition would be creating disunity. These people are often at the center of, of problems. And so th this means that uh, they often cause people to stand apart from one another. Where there are interpersonal problems in the church, these people are often uh, involved in these, in these problems. So however, we need to remember that division always is not just involving one person, right? There's usually, if there's, a, if there's an argument, there's more than one person. There's at least two people involved. There's at least, you know, sometimes three or more people involved. But that being said, not everyone involved in some kind of dispute is a divisive person. But, you know, if over the years a common denominator keeps emerging with search problems, then we need to start looking out to see if there may be some divisive people in the midst of those uh, disputes. And we're talking about people who may just commonly be causing uh, a problem. So we need to be on the watch and look out for this. So I want us all to ask ourselves individually, am I... Are we involved in causing any problems among brethren? You know, we need to think about this. Have we been involved in some kind of dispute uh, among our brethren that has caused some kind of disunity? We always want to think it's the other person, right? If there's an argument involved, we are quick to point and justify ourselves that there's something else going on. But look back and say, you know, as a result of my own behavior, have I caused any kind of disunity? Have I caused people to divide up into groups or to take sides on an issue un uh, unnecessarily. These are things we need to ask ourselves and be, be careful of. But also, let's look at <coughs> the next part that this, this passage warns us about, and that is creating these doctrinal obstacles. Now, this is what I'm keying in on here. He's saying, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. And so we need to look at this word that's, that's used here for offenses. I think the New King James uses offensive. King James uses offenses, I believe. There's a couple other versions, including the ESV, that uses the word obstacles. And that seems to be, uh, among the more modern translations, that seems to be the idea, obstacles. New American Standard says hindrances. Uh, so people who are causing not just division, but they're causing offenses, obstacles, uh, hindrances. What's he talking about here? Well, these are hindrances uh, perhaps to the work, hindrances throwing roadblocks in the way. And so the idea here is this. You know what? Uh, honest questions are going to come up from time to time about uh, doctrines, and that's good, and that's healthy. But people that constantly question such doctrines without ever moving uh, forward or beyond them, they can become divisive. So when Paul says, you know, we need to watch out for those who create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught, he's referring to those who would regularly derail other Christians with doctrinal traps and doctrinal puzzles, um, you may remember back to high school, there were certain students in a classroom that when they walked in, you know, the teacher hated to see them walk in because they knew that the, the class was just always going to be disrupted with some kind of tangent or some kind of question that could never be answered and, and brought no uh, fruit to the discussion. These kind of people, they, sh they love to show their knowledge and creativity with scripture, but not to encourage others to move forward to become better Christians. They seem to have more insight into scripture than real fruit in their lives by implementing the scripture. And so they enjoy building up an arsenal of doctrinal obstacles and hypothetical situations to puzzle everyone around them. So we need to ask ourselves, are we guilty of creating 
these doctrinal obstacles. And we've probably all been guilty of this, right? You know, uh, uh, flexing our knowledge in a Bible class or derailing something, uh, creating doctrinal obstacles. And so the idea here is that these people, if you notice in verse 18 here, these people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. They serve their own bellies. That means their own appetites. Uh, they're involved just enough, just enough in the church to cause divisions and, to, and mentally engage just enough to encourage everyone else or to discourage everyone else um, and trip everyone else up because they really just don't care about Jesus, according to this passage. They're serving their own desires. They care about serving their own selves. They're hungry, but they're not hungry for righteousness, is the idea. And so we need to ask ourselves this question. Are we guilty of these things at times? Are we serving ourselves? Are we serving God? Are we trying to promote uh, other people to move forward and be better Christians? Or are we just causing a hindrance to that? Are we helping the work, or are we hurting the work of the Lord. And also I want to talk about the third thing this passage discusses, and that is manipulative speech. If you look at this, <clears throat> he says in verse 18, for those who uh, are such do not serve our Lord but their own belly, and by smooth words, that's what we're keying in on, by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. And so that's where the ice cream man comes in. You know, everybody loves, all the kids love to see the ice cream man coming and the noise playing as he comes down the street. Why? Because he's got the goodies. It looks good. Uh, these people are smooth talkers. They're flatterers. And why is, why is ice cream so dangerous? Well, because it goes down so smooth, doesn't it? It goes down real smooth. And the things that divisive people will often say will taste great. Oh, sorry. What's that? It'll taste great. It'll sound good. It'll be pleasing to the ears. That You'll want to hear these things. But the effects of it can be very dangerous, and we need to be aware of this. You would um, you'd normally think that this guy would be the guy that we'd be looking out for for division. And yes, that's true, that these kind of people uh, can cause problems in the church, and they often do. But it's not usually the brutish and abrasive person that's truly dangerous in the church. These people obviously have their problems. Anybody can see it. It's the smooth talkers and the flatterers that really, because, of their, because they sound good and make you feel good about yourself, these are the people that are really dangerous. They're serpent-like, and you'll want to listen to them. You'll want to hear their ideas. But we must watch out for those whose words are smoother than their actual lives. Those who can speak well to your face, but then will talk bad about you behind your back. Because these kind of people, they don't really care about the truth so much as the effect they can produce on you, and they're trying to manipulate you. Well, why is it so dangerous? The, the passage tells us, if you'll look there, it's because it destroys the naive. It destroys the hearts of the simple. The sort of things that are listed here, they don't really seem so bad when compared to other horrible things that go on in the church, like a man taking his father's wife and these other things, but it does ruin lives, and that's the, imp that's the, that's the point of this verse. These things do ruin uh, other Christians. The language he uses here is it deceives the hearts of the simple, not just deceive, but deceive their very hearts. And the heart's often used as, as being identified with the innermost part of our being, uh, our very identity. Uh, it's not just that they corrupt vulnerable Christians. They're really just reprogramming them into the image uh, of their own falsehood. And, they're, and, and that's that really they're trying to take control and manipulate them. And wasn't that the same thing as uh, Satan's approach in the Garden of Eden? When, when, uh, when, Eve, when Satan came up to Eve, he slithered up to naive Eve in the form of a serpent. And now uh, he slithers up to Christians in the form of the ice cream man, you know, divisive people, the smooth talkers, and, and people who manipulate. So we need to make no mistake that divisiveness, and doctrinal obstacles, manipulative speech, these things are all evil. And that's what he says here at the end. He says, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And that's why he's giving this instruction. These things are, in fact, evil. And the, and the command is that we must, we must bend away or avoid such people that are in league with Satan himself and will destroy an unsuspecting church. Now, oftentimes, these people are deceived themselves, and they don't realize that they're even doing this. And so we're not necessarily asking them, oh, are you trying to deceive? Are you trying to manipulate? No, it's the, it's the result of their actions. You can see by what they're doing who they're serving. If they're serving God, you can see the fruit that's being produced in their life. Now... We need to ask ourselves, are we guilty 
of manipulating brethren, our brethren, to get our own way? Have there been times where we have massaged the situation or said certain things that we could have manipulated people? Have we been a smooth talker and a flatterer? And so I want to point out that we're probably all guilty of this to some degree. So before any of us get up on our high horse and, and start thinking about somebody that we think that sh you know, should be labeled as divisive, we need to think plainly about our own sins in this matter. I, I suspect that all of us have been involved in some of these things like gossip, uh, exaggerating things, uh, complaining about somebody to somebody else and, 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 getting, and, and making that person have sympathy with us. We're turning, when we do that, we're turning that person against the, the other person, you see. We're causing division. I'm sure we've made a show of our knowledge sometime in a, in a Bible class or our creativity with the verse, not necessarily to serve Jesus or to encourage others to move forward for Christ, but just to serve our own appetites, to, get, to serve our own way to get attention. We've given also probably false praise to someone's face to avoid some kind of awkwardness or to flatter them or to get our way or make them, make them like us. But we need to remember that God says that these things are evil. And these things are serious. They're not just something that we should take lightly. We should hold ourselves to a higher standard. And they're, they're very subtle evils. It's, slate, it's Satan, you know, using us to manipulate and to cause problems in the church. And so we must avoid those who are pros at doing this kind of stuff. That's, that's, the, that's the key. Uh, we must pursue unity. We must pursue doctrinal purity and honest, honest speech with one another. Honest and forthcoming speech, not being hiding, not avoiding problems, but actually addressing these things. So what do we should do? We should despair, throw our arms up in the air and say, ah, oh, you know, you know I'm, I'm discouraged now that, that Joe's talked about this <laughs> and, and I'm going to go home, I'm really bummed out. No, because there's a promise at the end of this, God's promise. And that is, he says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. You know, that's what he was encouraging the Romans. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. And so in all these things, we can never despair. We must never despair, never give up, because God will soon crush Satan, who is ultimately the one behind all of, all of this manipulation and divisiveness that's being caused. He's going to crush him under our feet. And so, as a result of that, we have much to rejoice about, don't we? We have much to be happy about and hopeful for the future. We need to have confidence that we can move forward as, as a church and, and be watchful and, and be mindful that God is going to, his will will be done and that he will ultimately, he always wins. And so in closing, I want to remind us of these things. We need to watch out, but we don't need to be suspicious, you know. Don't just automatically suspect that, that every brethren, every time he tries to say something to me, you know, my wife, you know, she's trying to manipulate me or, or Rich or, you know, Steve, you know, trying to manipulate me. That's not what I'm saying. And, you know, we, we, don't, need to, we don't need to just avoid these things either, you know, because it's a responsibility that God's told us to do. We need to avoid creating those divisions uh, we need to avoid those who are creating those divisions and obstacles because it is, a, it is an instruction. It's an inspired instruction. It's an inspired command. And so we can't just neglect it because if we neglect it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. You know, those people who are, who are left unchecked doing these things, it's just going to cause more division, more obstacles, and the work ultimately is going to get hindered. And so action is required is what I want to stress here. We've we, we got to hold each other to a higher standard. And, and we got to hold ourselves to a higher standard. So we're not just, not just pointing the finger at other people, you see. Um, the Bible tells us we have to get the log out of our own eye you know, before we can effectively help other people. We need to ensure that we're not the problem, in other words. We need to ensure that we're not. We may not be doing the thing that the other person is doing, but we may be doing something just as bad. You know? We may not be causing fights in the parking lot, <laughs> but we may be gossiping behind other people's back, you see, and, and they're both divisive. And so we need to also know that God will crush Satan. And that, I take great encouragement from that. You know, um, the idea that your sin will find you out. Sin will surface at some point. It, it will not be hid forever. I take great comfort in knowing that and hopeful for the future. Um, again, this has is, is been a lesson going towards uh, our goal to hold each other for a higher standard for the year. One of those things we need to make sure that we're not uh, accepting a lower standard of, of unity, a lower standard of, of just being a congregation that, that says it's okay to gossip behind other people's backs. It's okay to turn brethren toward, against other brethren. It's okay to, to
to do these kinds of things, to, to show off in, in a Bible class or disrupt the work of the church. It's not okay to do those things. We need to be unified so that we can create and, and build for God and, and bring glory and praise to him, not ourselves. And so it's our custom to uh, provide an invitation at this time. Those who uh, want to respond in a particular way, want to repent of sins or accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, commit your life to Christ. Maybe somebody has never committed their life to Christ and want to do that. Maybe you once committed it, you need to recommit. We encourage you to do that too. We want you to be a part of God's work. God wants you to be a part of his work in his kingdom. And more importantly, you can't do that if you're still in your sins. Um, and and I, I don't know why, why you'd be concerned about building if you still have uh, sins that you don't have to take care of. There's priorities involved. And so the most important thing is we need to be a vessel that's holy and ready to be used for the master's service. And God says, no matter what we've done, that we can, we can do that. But we can't be expected to be used in a useful way to God while we're still in an unholy situation, you see. In order to do that, we've got to purify ourselves to become ready to, that, that God would use us. For, you know, just like my wife uh, would wash the dishes and, you know, and everything's prepared so that it can be used. We have to get the, remove all the dirt from ourselves, which is the sin in our lives. And that's what, that's what we do through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so if you haven't accepted the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you of your sins, I, I encourage you to do that. We do that by uh, believing uh, that he is the only way to heaven, that we have peace with God through him. And then we make a, a conscious decision to turn away from our current lifestyle, stop following our own desires, and start following what he wants us to do. And that's, that's, that's term called belief and repentance, you know, repenting from what I want to do and, and following God. And Acts, you know, in Acts 2.38 says, if you repent and be baptized, you'll be forgiven of your sins. And so uh, baptism, we're baptized into Christ, become a part of his body, and then we live faithfully. We, Matthew 28 says you know, that we're supposed to teach those to do all the things that Christ had commanded to do. And so we encourage you to do that. If anyone is subject to that invitation this morning, um, we ask you to uh, make your needs known. If you don't want to do it in a public way, we ask you to and get those questions you might have answered. But what we're looking and encouraging you to do is to make a commitment, make a bigger commitment to Christ. Make a bigger commitment to your service to God. And also, don't be a hindrance to the work. You know, help the work and not hurt the work. And also be watchful for those who may uh, cause hindrances, divisions, and obstacles. If you're subject to the invitation, we ask you to come forward as we stand and sing.